Cool. All right. Hey, man. Nice to see you. Nice to be here. How are you? I'm happy to be in what seems like a log cabin in the middle of the forest, but it's actually in the middle of Toronto. <laughs> That's it's, right. Uh, well, it's the, cool. the home is a warmer experience. It's yeah, nice. Home yeah. is a good place. The city's always been really good to you, and you've always been good to this city. The city? Yeah. You know, the first time I came to Canada, we came across Niagara Falls, and um, at immigration, they gave me a social security card immediately, <laughs> which I was kind of bemused by. And then uh, we drove along a little way, and there was an apple tree by the roadside. And I said, you know, I really fancy an apple. So we stopped the van, picked a nice bright red Canadian apple, and I thought, I like this country. I got a social security <laughs> card and free food. Um, yeah, and then we played uh, Horseshoe Tavern and The Edge and yeah. – Massey Hall, and then it got bigger. But uh, well, even the police picnic. The city always feel like home, yeah, for some reason. Well, let's go to the home. Let's talk about the, this this new project. You, you've known the story of your life, but when did you start to dive into this story and to make it into something? You know, it's it's always been at the back of my mind that um, where I come from was such an extraordinary, surreal industrial environment although at the time I was living there I, I didn't realize it but it was a gift um, as much as I wanted to leave where I came from and thought I didn't belong there uh, I realized in hindsight that it was an extraordinary um, stimulating place for an artist to to grow up because you were surrounded by ex massive symbolic metal structures, ships. And the shape of a ship for me is always a powerful, emotive one. Because my earliest memory is of walking out my front door, looking south and seeing nothing but a giant hull. I mean, literally towering over the house. We lived 100 yards from a shipyard. And um, it was dark in the window because the ship would, you know, blot the sun out because we as, as far north as you are here. Yeah. Um, and I'd watch thousands of men walk to work every morning and pray to God that that wasn't going to be my destiny because it was a dangerous, dark, frightening place. So I studied at school. I got a scholarship and managed to escape that. And then I escaped my town. But in later years, I realized that that was the place that had formed me in the first you know, decade of my life and beyond. Sure. Through the years of the decades of repetition of being an artist, making a record, playing a show, you have a, I'm sure you have a familiarity with some version of the process. It's my living room. Right. So, Walking on stage, I know, I know where the furniture is. I know not to fall over it. Right. I can do it in the dark. It, that, this is what I'm saying. It's, challenges are different than the challenges you would have had to do this. And it might have been interesting to go, oh, fuck, I'm rubbing up against things now that I'm not used to rubbing up against. It's good to be out of your comfort zone sometimes. And theater is such a collaborative enterprise. Um, you're dealing with actors, writers, producers, directors, um, production designers, um, you know, costume people. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like a giant ship, you know, where there's many moving parts and... Every night is different mm -hmm. because one little thing will will change everything else. And so you walk on stage without a safety net, and I love it. I really love it. The You also reworked the musical, right? I think the idea that you could finish a musical is completely alien to me. Um, I, I think in the theater they, they say, oh, it's locked now. That's it. That's anathema to me. You never finish tinkering with it, thinking how it could be better uh, night by night, incrementally. And also every time a production goes out, you want to make it, it better. It's never finished and never will be. Are you like that in your life? Absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm not finished either. Uh, that's kind of boring. You might as well die. You know, human beings are constantly striving for novelty. Mm -hmm. Um, I always say that the most important thing in music is surprise. Uh, I need, if I'm listening to music, I want to be surprised within four bars or eight bars. 
If they ate bars, you haven't surprised me. I'm gone. It's over. Uh, I want to surprise people, so I need to surprise myself. So I don't know what's, what's next. This is going to take a bunch of your time, I imagine. This is going to take me here in Toronto until almost the end of March. Right. And then we've been invited to go to Los Angeles in the new year with, with the, this production. So I'm excited about that. But in the interim, I have this other job where I, I sing for money. You do? Yep. Oh, and is it, how's that going? How's it's that working going out well. for you? Yeah? It's going very well. Yeah. yeah. You're getting on, you're finding an audience? <laughs> no, they find me. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, but do you feel like you need, do you have other songs ready to go? Is that, is that? The that- songs come when they come. You can't force it. Um, have any I, arrived? I used to think I have to be on output all the time, yeah. but you need to be on input some of the time. You have to live a life, you know. Uh, I'm in that stage at the moment where I'm, I'm just refining what I've already written. Right. But then, then there comes this compulsion to you know fill a vacuum, fill a hole, or fill a blank page, which is kind of scary. Uh, but as I say, I don't quite know how it's done at this point in time. But I'm always grateful when it does happen. Do you um, do you recognize when that started to change in you? This idea of thinking I need to be a little bit more on input. I, I recognized it very early on after uh, initial success that there was a routine. You know, you'd you'd, you'd record, you'd immediately go on tour, and then record again. Mm-hmm. So. I was on this kind of uh, little. Uh, it was an album a year to start. An it was album an a year, album absolutely. a year. Yeah, that's that's the way it was done. But that, then, as you get more successful, you have more sort of. You know, the, the, it's kind of limitless how much time you can take. But I kind of like the pressure of saying, "Oh, we have to finish an album by a certain date. Otherwise, it it just does go on forever." Um, so I've I've been pretty rapid with uh, the output recently, mm-hmm. the past couple of years. But uh, there are no rules. We had Robert Plant in here a little while ago, and he said that for him anyway, you have to you have to keep working with the mojo because once it's gone, it's gone, and you can't get it back. Is that your experience? I don't know the answer to that. Um, that may be true. I yeah. don't know. Have you ever felt like the, that compulsion to create, even when you're in input mode, is your brain always swirling around? No, I'll always want to make sound yeah. you know that's my s- church if you like that's how i connect to something greater than me is is to make music you know i don't think you ever get to the end of music it's limitless you know if you think you know everything about arranging then l- listen to ravel <laughs> you know <laughs> or composing listen to bark you know or, or, Brian Wilson. I, I mean, you know, it's the, it just keeps going. And those people will tell you the same thing. Mm-hmm. When you wanted to get the education, when did it trigger you in your brain that it's like, oh, I can, I, I, I can play this instrument. I'd like to do music. When? Well, my mother was a piano player, and um, I used to watch her play, and I could see the joy that she got from it, and I understood. Uh, that I could do that as well. But I, I've never, I can't remember a time when I didn't actually play something. Do you remember the song she would play? The what? She used to play tangos. Yeah. She liked tangos for some reason. She's, she's not Argentine. Yeah. <laughs> she's from the north of England. But I think she liked the exoticism of tango music, the, 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 the rhythm of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, she could play a little classical music, but tangos is what, what I remember her playing. Right. When you hear a tango now, does that take you back? Yeah. Yeah? No, my my mum was definitely uh, my muse, my inspiration. Lovely. Um, What happens to a town when the last ship is built? Say again? What happens to the town when the last ship is built and when that all closes up, the practical? Uh, There were only two um, sources of employment in the town. The one was the coal mine at one end of the place and the other was the shipyard. The coal mine closed. The government closed it, and then the government closed the shipyard uh, for no good reason that I could think of. Mm-hmm. And then what happens? Died. 
that. I mean, it's had a bit of a rebirth lately because uh, they're using those skills to to build wind turbines, which is kind of related. But you know, a whole generation of skill set was just thrown on the scrap heap. Right. You know, we'd been building ships in my town since the Middle Ages, and uh, it was just gone. I wonder what happens in the homes. You know, at night when people realize, because it's not like, oh, we will get another job. It's that realization that this is over. And what happens to the psychology of a community and the psychology of that generation? Well, it's brutal. Mm -hmm. It's totally brutal. Um, I I escaped that. Yeah. I didn't. I didn't uh, experience that. Mm. But you can't take take people's work away from them. We know, we are what we do. Your identity is wrapped up. If you said to me, "I can't, I, I can't make music anymore," I, I, that'd become a shell. Right. I'm not sure how long I would survive. Want to play a song? Hmm? Should we play a song? Shall I play a song? Yeah, want to play a song? Yeah, sure. I'll play um, the title song of the last ship okay. because it's called the last ship. <laughs> It's all there in the Gospels The Magdalene girl comes to pay her respects But her mind is a wool When she finds the tomb empty The straw had been rolled Not a sign of a corpse In the dark and the cold When she reaches the door Sees an unholy sight There's a solitary figure In a halo of light He just carries on floating past Calvary Hill in an almighty hurry Aye, but she might catch him still Tell me where are you going, Lord And why in such haste Now don't hinder me, woman I've no time to waste For they're launching a boat On the morrow at noon And I have to be there before daybreak Oh, I cannot be missing The lads will expect me Why else would the good Lord himself Resurrect me for nothing will stop me I have to prevail Through the teeth of this tempest In the mouth of a gale May the angels protect me If all else should fail When the last ship sails Oh, the roar of the chains And the cracking of timbers The noise at the end of the world In your ears as a mountain of steel makes its way to the sea And the last ship sails It's a strange kind of beauty It's coal and a steel And whatever it was that you've done to be here it's the sum of your hopes, your despairs and your fears When the last ship sails Oh, the roar of the chains And the cracking of timbers The noise at the end of the world in your ears As a mountain of steel makes its way to the sea And the last ship sails And whatever you promised Whatever you've done and whatever the station in life you become In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son And no matter the weave of this life that you've spun On the earth or in heaven or under the sun When the last ship sails Oh, the roar of the chains and the cracking of timbers the noise at the end of the world in your ears As a mountain of steel makes its way to the sea And the last ship sails When the last ship sails Beautiful. Did it feel like you were visiting ghosts when you went back into that part of your, your life in that neighborhood? Well, 
Literally, yeah. A lot of people I was singing about, writing about are dead, which uh, actually gave me some freedom. Um, you know, I, I think at a certain point in your life, you need to go back to the place you were spawned, like a salmon would, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to um, figure out who you are, because who you are is, is formed in those early years. What did you figure out about yourself? What did I figure out? Yeah. Um, that my sense of decency, my sense of self was bred there, my, my, my sense of identity, my work ethic, my discipline mm -hmm. was bred there, my uh, the ambition to escape <laughs> came from there. There's such a big divide in our culture, certainly in the, con the national conversation, and every country feels this way for the most part, many countries do, rural versus urban. And there is this, this thing about the working class in, the, in, in towns and then the big city life. Why do you think that, not that it was rural, but why do you think that exists, that kind of, that, that breakdown? Between, just between the, yeah, urban and rural? Yeah, just the, you know, the, the people, how they feel represented and seen. I mean, I, 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 don't, I don't see it. I, I don't see people separately like that. Yeah. You know, I think people have an identity formed from where, the, where they live. If you live on a farm, right. that's your identity. If you live in an industrial city, that's another one. But is one better or worse? No. No, of course not. But, the, <laughs> but they're, used as, they're used as political tools. They're divisive. Uh, well, you know, that's used cynically by politicians to get to gain power to 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 separate them and us. Mm -hmm. They are not like us. But that's that's an old game, yeah. and we shouldn't keep falling for it. You know, because the people who perpetrate it are untrustworthy, and uh, you know, I, I see through it mm -hmm. completely. But uh, it's been used since the beginning of time. Divide and conquer was the Roman motto. That's right. And when you were young, did you see through it? No. I mean, uh, no. I, I've ne I had never felt as if I had to hate somebody else to feel better about my, myself. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I wasn't educated to be racist or elitist or anything else, you know. I, just, I take people at their face value as, as they mm -hmm. value themselves. When you were going through the writing process of this and the songs, and, and what did you think about your family? What do I think about my family? What did family? you think about your family? Were you, did you spend time thinking about your... Obviously, you'd be thinking about your mother and your father, but... Uh, yeah. You know, the characters in the play are sort of composites of uh, members of my family or people I grew up with. People I lived next door to. Um, in a way, I'm trying to honor my parents, particularly my old man, who, you know, he and I had a difficult mm -hmm. relationship that never really uh, was reconciled. So my w work is, 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 that's part of my work, you know, to, to deal with that. My dad died very young, as did my mom. So we never had... Uh, that chance to understand each other uh, as equals. You know, I'm older than my father was when he died. Yeah. And so I'm, I've been allowed to mature more, in a sense. So I, I look at my parents as being almost my children. You know, mm -hmm. my, they brought me into the world when my mom was 18. My dad was barely 20. Mm -hmm. They were kids bringing me up. And the clue. <laughs> <laughs> and my mom was the same age, and it, it, they just do whatever they can. And then there's this expectation from a lot of kids that their parents should be great parents, perfect parents. But hindsight teaches you that's impossible. It's not just thing as a perfect parent. Right. You know, I, I'm a parent, and with all the hindsight that I gained as a child, <laughs> I, am I any better? I don't know yet. If that's my kids, you know, there's there's no perfect upbringing, there's right. no perfect life, and I think that's the lesson. The idea of not having the chance to reconcile, were you the kind of person that it was hoping for it? No. No, it's only later that uh, not having mourned my parents in the standard way, I was kind of cursed to mourn them in a more protracted way. You know, I 
writing songs, which is not a bad way of going about it, but it, it just takes longer. But you have you have to mourn your parents. It's, I've heard you talk about how you did not go to the funerals to, so you wouldn't distract from it. Yeah. What did you do at two o'clock in the afternoon on that day, or whenever it was? Like, how did you process? I was working. I was uh, on tour. How was that? How was that? Just that's just the way it was. My parents died very suddenly. I saw yeah. them before they died. Yeah. It's not as if I didn't completely right. ignore them. And, <laughs> right. And um, I saw them in the you know in the deathbed. But I, I didn't go to the funeral. I didn't want the ritual. I, I thought I didn't need it. That's um, that's interesting. I was happier working. Yeah. Um, do I regret it? Not sure. Not sure. You know, you also bring a lot of sort of unwelcome attention yeah. to a very private affair. I didn't want to do that. Right. Um, but you know, it's, it's it's an issue we address in the in the last ship. The 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 leader of the play doesn't go to his father's funeral. He has mm-hmm. to explain why. What was it like writing that? Um, I sort of wrote it unconsciously. I think I revealed more about myself in the play than I actually meant to, just by accident. But you know, I'm being truthful about my feelings because they're unconscious. They just come out on the page and that's what they are. I, I haven't tailored my feelings to uh, to make myself feel better. Some of it's quite painful. So to sit backstage and to watch this happen, to be honest, to watch this, to relive this, is there a catharsis in it for you? It's a strange feeling because I'm looking at the the backdrop you know, there's wonderful p- projected images of the shipyard with the, the exact cranes I remember as a child and the rooftops. And this is 60 years later. I'm seeing this thing in this very beautiful artistic form, and I think that's, that was my reality. Right. It's an odd, an odd feeling, and I'm hearing people say things that come from me or sing things that come from me. So I don't take it for granted and um, I think it's cathartic. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're in this a culture now, which is in, in a very positive way, giving people mechanisms for self care, which from the previous generation, it was un, mm. unheard of. And just having this experience, I mean, you're not old, but you're not young. To at this age, to still be going through this this grieving, that's very. You know, I've I've seen this play. Um, myself being sat in the audience um, with someone else playing the the character I'm playing. I'm sitting surrounded by uh, grown men uh, crying in the dark. It's not uh, usual. People who don't clearly don't cry very often. Right. And that is very moving and gratifying at the same time because they're, so they're resonating with something they feel either their fathers or their grandfathers or themselves. And that's an experience I can't really, uh, you know, explain. Mm -hmm. It's it's extraordinary. It's this very modern conversation about masculinity that's happening today, right? But for decades and decades before, that was just not part of it. Mm. You didn't cry. You had to be tough. You had to do all these things. But these people were humans and they had post-traumatic stress and they had trauma and they had all these things mm. uh, to deal with and, and you, you're working through it with them, which is strange. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's still bottled up in particularly males. We're not really supposed to cry. Yeah. But when we do, we clearly, we clearly <laughs> need to. Are you a crier? Do you cry? Not very often, no. No? No. Nice. You want to play another song? What's the next song? I was going to play a song... Um, Called Dead Man's Boots. Yeah. Uh, it's from the play again. It's a. It's about the. Imp- Sometimes you know a father's love is misconstrued as as being uh, overbearing mm-hmm. and controlling, and conversely, a son's ambition can seem like some sort of pie in the sky fantasy. Neither are wrong, mm-hmm. but they rarely reconcile. Here we go. <laughs> See these 
were boots in my hands, they'd probably fetch you now, my son. Take them, they're a gift from me. Why don't you try them on? It would do your old man good to see you walking in these boots one day. And take your place among the men who work upon the slipway. These dead man's boots throw the roll and curl When a fella needs a job and a place in the world It's time for a man to put down roots And walk to the river in his old man's boots I'm dying son and asking That you do one final thing for me You barely put a sapling on You think that you're a tree Need a seed to prosper You must first put down some roots Just one foot then the other In these dead man's boots Now why in the hell would I do that? Why would I agree? When his hand was all that I'd received As far as I remember Not as if he'd spoilt me With his kindness up to then you see I had a plan of my own and I'd quit this place When I came of age, September These dead man's boots know the way down the hill They can walk there themselves and they probably will I'd plenty of choices, I'd plenty of other routes And he'd never see me walking in these dead man's boots Or was it made him think I'd be happy ending up like him when he'd hardly got two hippenies left Or a broken pot to piss in It's not as if he spoiled me With his kindness up to then, you see I'd a plan of my own and I'd quit this place When I came of age, September These dead man's boots know the way down the hill They can walk there themselves and they probably will But they won't walk with me cause I'm off the other way I've had it up to here, I'm gonna have my say when all you got left is that cross on the wall I want nothing from you, I want nothing at all Not a pension or a pittance when your whole life is through Get this through your head, I'm nothing like you i done with all the arguments, there'll be no more disputes And you'll never see me walking in these dead men All right, so Sting, when you, if those songs come, if those lyrics come out and it's subconscious, when you sit back and you look at what's on the page, what are you thinking? It hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Those are real conversations that people have all the time. Hmm. It hurts. Um, was that quote that I heard attributed to you, you did... You did better with your hands than I did with mine? <laughs> yeah, that was an interesting uh, meeting. My dad and I met in the hospice, you know, and he was sitting there. He was 60, barely 60. Yeah. And uh, I took his hand and, you know, he said, I said, we have the same hands. It's a big, gnarly knuckles and <laughs> working man's hands. And he'd never paid me a compliment in my life, actually. <laughs> and I said, Dad, we got the same hands. I've never noticed. He says, I bet you used your hands better than I did. Oh. And that was uh, pretty devastating in this timing, you know. Yeah. Uh, and that was our reconciliation. And uh, it was wonderful. That's a moment. Mm. Should we play Fragile? Fragile? Yeah. I'm feeling a bit fragile yeah. at the moment. But you're handling it with <laughs> grace. <laughs> Beautifully. If blood will flow When flesh and steel are one Drying in the color of the evening sun Tomorrow's rain will wash the stains away But something in our mind will always stay 
Perhaps this final act was meant To clinch a lifetime's argument That nothing comes from violence And nothing ever could For all those born beneath an angry star Lest we forget how fragile we are And on and on the rain will fall Like tears from a star Like tears from a star And on and on the rain will say How fragile we are 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 All right, let's close on this last question here before you, you, you go. When you do something that is so deeply personal and your family watches it, are they things, are they learning about you? Uh, yes, they're learning about me. They're also learning about themselves. You know, I'm the family scribe. And um, uh, even though they might find it painful, they've learned that it's their therapy as well. Yeah. You know, that I mean, the, the initial reaction might, why are you saying that? Why are you, why are you saying this to the world? And my answer is because I have to. Mm-hmm. And um, they, they've realized the value of it. Um, perhaps not immediately, but in, in the long term, right. it's better to have these things spoken about, even publicly, yeah. uh, than to have them bottled up. You know, because that's toxic. And by saying them, you it's a big step to addressing them, not just thinking about it, but to yeah. say it. You bring things into the light, yeah. you know, because they grow toxic in the dark. So it's better to have them out. Thanks for coming in, man. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That was my morning therapy session. <laughs> Who do, do I pay you? Yeah, I'm just going to do some photos now. So. Yeah, it was intense.